But anyways, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another cloudy afternoon of Chem 170 with your host, me, Dr. White. I hope you all had a nice, nice couple of days since we last met. I did a lot of housework and other things, school stuff. And let's get going. All right. Remember, Wednesday after class, I will send out, in lab two, I will send out the password for test number two. Test number two covers uh, alcohols, thiols, uh, ethers, ethylene oxide reactions, aldehydes, and ketones. Wow, that's a mouthful. And remember, I've already posted the breakdown. Test number two will have uh, real world questions or, and it will also have nomenclature and reactions. And nomenclature, remember there are two types. One is here's the molecule, give the IUPAC name. The other is here's the name, draw the structure. Next, wow, this is thirsty work. Next, reactions and reactions, two types. One is give the pro organic product or products for the following. Then on test number two, I think I had three or four, I can't remember, but give the starting materials. And as I mentioned, test number two, like one, will have five, five, yes, five bonus points. You pick which bonus points, I don't. I just had the whole thing add up to 105. So I would ask, first of all, are there any questions about test number two? Well, in that case, I better get started in my world famous review for the next test, in this case, test number two. Remember what you see on the screen right now is available in D2L in the lecture folder, secretly named test number two review. Am I sneaky or what? Uh-oh, it's awful humor Monday. All right, let's start. Alcohols, how do you name them? You find the longest chain or ring and you name it as an alkane or cycloalkane. Then you drop the E and for alcohols, you add OL. Now, if it's acyclic, you also have a number which carbon the hydroxyl group is on. And that always has priority, meaning lowest number. Remember, you always start numbering from the ends of a chain. Now, if it's in a ring, you don't need a number. Because for my class, since I'm only dealing with until later on, we get into fats and oils and other things, where we'll use common names, not IUPAC. But for now, I'll only have one functional group. So in a ring, the carbon with the hydrox group of an alcohol is always carbon number one. Now, there's a special name I asked you to learn. And that is benzene ring with a hydroxyl group. The common name became the IUPAC name, and that's called phenol. No, not phenol. Uh, I've been one company I worked at where we used millions of pounds of this. I had a running argument with the other chemists how to pronounce it. I think I was right. They don't. <laughs> All right. Next, I taught you common names for alcohols. How do you do a common name for an alcohol? You name the R group uh, with the uh, attached to the hydroxyl group as an alkyl group. And at the end of that, you add the word alcohol. And example, rubbing alcohol has 70% isopropyl alcohol and 30% water. You can also, for a number of years now, get 90% isopropyl alcohol, 10% water. And I have both in my house, especially with the pandemic. Those are good things to have around. Now, on a test, I'll never ask you what's the common name of a structure, but I will ask you to know how to draw the structure from a common name.
how do you make an alcohol? Well, this is the only reaction I'll ever have this semester that will be on two different tests. On test one, you saw it, and it can be on test two. Take a double bond, add acid and water. Remember, water is HOH. Break the pi bond. One carbon gets H, the other gets OH, and it follows Markovnikov's rule. And Markovnikov's rule is that the carbon with the most hydrogens gets the hydrogen, the other gets the hydroxyl group. Or as I learned many, many, many years ago, ouch, <laughs> those that have, have it get them, or the rich get richer and the poor get poor. And we're talking about the carbon with the hydrogens. All right, now, reactions of alcohols. You take an alcohol and react it with sulfuric acid, H2SO4, the little triangle means heat. Now, a lot of times I don't put the temperature, meaning high heat, but if you just see the triangle, that will work. Uh, just a reminder, on my test in the final, I will never, ever put down a reaction, ask you to give the product or products, organic product or products, and the answer will be no reaction. That will never be a correct answer on any of my tests or final. And if you take sulfuric acid and heat, you lose water, hydroxyl group from the alcohol, adjacent carbon with a hydrogen, and you form a carbon-carbon double bond that follows Zaseth's rule, which is you get the double bond alkene that has the most, listen carefully, carbon atoms directly bonded to the carbons of the double bond. And we went through this in the problem set. All right, next, you take an alcohol reactor with HX, hydrohalogen acid, X can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. You replace the hydroxyl group with the halogen on the carbon with the hydroxyl group. Now, since this could add, react with a double bond, someone came up one of these days, I'll have to find out who, not today. Take an alcohol reactor with SOCl2, thionyl chloride, replace the hydrox group on that carbon. The hydrox group is on with a chlorine. Now, if you take an alcohol and oxidize it, primary alcohol, and remember bracket O bracket means oxidation reagent, you form a carbon oxygen double bond as you learn later on, that's an ally. If you oxidize a secondary alcohol, you'll lose the hydrogen here and here and you'll get a ketone. Now, tertiary alcohols can't be oxidized, you get no reaction. So you know what that means? I'll never put that on a test of mine where I ask you to give the product. Now, next we learned about something real stinky. Eh. And that's thiols. I shouldn't have said that because it helps protect our lives, some of them. And thiols are the sulfur analog of an alcohol. Instead of OH, you have SH. Now, the important thing you should know, one, thiols stink. I mean stink. Think of skunk. What the skunk uses, that defensive weapon, is a mixture of thiols and water. If you've ever been around an animal or place where a skunk let loose or an animal is skunked, is that a proper verb? I think so. Ooh. Look out, I'm using English in my class verbs. But anyways, that stinks awful. Now, the other thing you should know is thiols, actually T-butyl thiol, is used in natural gas. And that's because methane, natural gas, is odorless. But guess what? You can smell a gas leak because, thank goodness, they now put thiols T butyl thiol in our natural gas so you can smell a leak. And if you remember, I told you the very sad, tragic story about the explosion in 1930s, middle 1930s in Texas in a high school and how that killed, I think, 135 students and teachers and injured badly a lot more. And from that came the 
um, the decision to put something in natural gas. They picked thiol. Remember, it's so stinky. There's one pound of thiol, or what? Four pounds pounds of thiol for every billion pounds of methane. Yeah, billion. All right. Let's talk about ethers. Ethers R O R prime. And that's an ether. Now, I didn't ask you to learn the IUPAC, but the common name is you name each R group as an alkyl group, and at the end, add the word ether. Now, there's only one reaction I asked you to learn with ethers, and that's the Williamson ether synthesis. You take an alkoxide, RO minus NA plus, reacted with an alkyl halide, R prime X. I didn't write it down here, bad Dr. White. X can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And that gives you an ether. Now the oxygen bonds to the carbon in R prime that has the halogen. And I'll say it again, the oxygen RO minus bonds to the carbon in R prime with the halogen. And an area I worked in heavily in industry, ethylene oxide. And this is epoxides, and I only asked you to learn one, and I'll never ask you what's the name of ethylene oxide, but I will use it. And if you react ethylene oxide one mole or one molecule in alcohol, you get this ether alcohol. And if you react now N moles, oops, N moles of ethylene oxide with the alcohol, you get this polyether alcohol. Everybody have your attention. Common mistake. Students put the hydroxyl group inside the bracket here. That's wrong, because that doesn't exist anywhere. Again, common mistake. Students put this hydroxyl group inside the bracket, not outside. Please don't make that mistake. All right. Next, I got to talk about one of my favorite areas. I know all of them I like, but some I like better than the others. It's sort of like, I don't know, candy. I like candy, but certain candy I like better than others. Well, anyways, let's talk about aldehydes and ketones. Aldehyde, carbon double bond to oxygen with a hydrogen and R group. Ketone, carbon double bond to oxygen with two R groups, R and R prime. Now, nomenclature for aldehydes. Now, before I, let's see, do I have it here? I'm gonna come back to this again, but remember, this is probably one of the most important things I know in all of organic chemistry, and that's the carbonyl group. And you should know, how to draw a carbonyl group. Look, I even put IMP, which is shorthand for important. And when I did that, my notes in college or high school, ooh, I better know that for the upcoming test. And a carbonyl is carbon double bond to oxygen. You should know how to draw it, draw it and describe it with words. Carbon double bond to oxygen. Now, if we look at an aldehyde, we have a carbonyl, carbon double bond to oxygen. How do you name it? You'll find the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon, the carbon double bond to oxygen, as you name it as a alkane, which you learned already. Aren't you glad at the beginning of the semester? I impressed upon you. Ooh, violent. Organic chemists are violent. Uh, to learn that table of the alkane names. Now you know what. Drop the E, add AL. Now, aldehydes, first of all, you can't have an aldehyde in a ring, impossible. And IUPAC and their infinite wisdom, because the carbonyl carbon rocks is the best. 
biased? Yes, I am, because I'm a carbonyl synthetic organic chemist at heart. And there's no number. And again, drop the E and AL. Now, word of caution. For test number two, alcohols have an OL ending. Aldehydes have an AL ending. When you write names, do it clearly. Because if I have to guess, is that OL or AL, I have a 50-50 chance of guessing wrong. You don't want me guessing on a test when I'm grading. So write your OL or for alcohol, AL for aldehyde clearly. Now, the carbonyl carbon is always one, and the rest of the alkyl groups you know how to handle. Now, there's a special aldehyde when R is a benzene. The common name is benzaldehyde. And I, you pack in their infinite wisdom, and I really mean this sincerely and totally, that what they did to come up with the whole nomenclature for chemicals, especially organic chemicals, is one of the wonders of the world, like the pyramid or anything else. It's amazing. And they said, oh, we're going to call the IUPAC name, same as the comet. This is benzaldehyde. Remember, that's responsible for the taste of cherries, like in Dr. Pepper, and also responsible for the taste of almonds, like in Amaretto. Oh, I'm giving away all the good stuff I like or marsupan. You don't know what marsupan is. Boy, are you missing a lot in life. All right, next, ketones, carbonyl, carbon double bond oxygen, R prime and R. How do you name it? Find the longest chain or ring with the carbonyl carbon, carbon double bond to oxygen. Name it as an alkane or cycloalkane. Drop the E, add O-N-E. I don't know why, but I almost never say one, the word one. I like to say O-N-E. Now, for acyclic, you need a number. Which carbon is the carbon in the chain that has the double bond to oxygen, the carbonyl carbon? That has priority. It always gets the lowest number closest to the end of the chain, period. And you name the rest of the alkyl groups as you know how to do. For a carbonyl, a ketone in a ring, cyclic, you need no number because the carbonyl carbon rocks and it's always number one, always. Now I asked you to learn two common names and structures. And Formaldehyde is the simplest aldehyde. Turns out R is H. And this is one way of drawing formaldehyde. And then the simplest ketone has a name, acetone. Now, acetone is, nobody calls it 2-propanone. It's acetone. And don't forget, acetone is used as nail polish remover. See, I removed all my nail polish. No, I don't think I've ever polished my nails. No, I haven't. By the way, nail polish, when you go and buy some, that's very, very sophisticated organic chemistry that goes into making that nail polish. Same thing with your mascara and also your cosmetics and your skin cream lotions. That's all very serious organic chemistry. We'll talk more about some of those later in the semester. Now, once again, you should know what is the carbonyl group. The carbonyl group is not a functional group, but it's found in other functional groups. You should know how to draw it. And you should know how to describe it with words, carbon or carbon atom, double bond to oxygen, or you can put down oxygen atom. And time out for a commercial from Dr. White. Don't forget this file that you're seeing this on the screen, PDF file, is available in the lecture section of Blackboard, cleverly named uh, Test Number Two Review. Wow.
I was clever. Not. All right. How do you make aldehydes and ketones? Take a primary alcohol oxide. So, ooh, deja vu all over again. Uh, and you see, you get an aldehyde. You oxidize a secondary alcohol, you get a ketone. Now, a very special type of aldehyde is if you take benzene and react to what we call acid chloride with aluminum trichloride catalyst, you make an aromatic ketone. One of the R groups is a benzene ring. And those are very useful, as I mentioned, in suntan lotion and sunblock lotion, because these absorb ultraviolet light that damage your skin and give you cancer if you're precluded due to hereditary reasons to get skin cancer from the sun. My brother-in-law and my nephew, yes, they were. I never was, and my sisters weren't. I guess that side of my, uh, my brother-in-law and his side of the family, though that inheritance happened. And they always put some kind of sunscreen on or wore a long sleeve, whatever, and a hat to make sure they didn't get exposed to the sun. Well, by the way, this reaction, I will never put a reverse reaction. Well, maybe I would. I take that back. All right, let's look at reactions of alcohols. If you take an alcohol or aldehyde, if R prime is H, that's an aldehyde. If R prime is carbon, it's a ketone. React with one molecule of alcohol, H plus is acid catalyst. Keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon, carbon double bond to oxygen. What's attached to it is still attached to it. And you get a hydroxyl group O and R and the R comes from the alcohol. If you take a ketone or aldehyde and react it with two molecules of alcohol, an acid catalyst, what's attached to carbonyl carbon R and R prime, and this should be our double prime right here. Oops, mistake. It's over here, but it fell off here. Sorry. And you get two OR groups on the carbonyl carbon. And as I mentioned, a special case, which my advisor's advisor, Herbert Stork, developed to put on what we call a protecting group, is if you react an aldehyde or ketone with ethylene glycol, that's this right here, and acid catalyst, think of this as two alcohols in the same molecule, you get this acetal or ketal, and students, for whatever reason I don't know, forget this carbon-carbon single bond between CH2 and CH2. Do you break carbon-carbon single bond? No. And, ooh, quick reminder of your friend on test number two. Do you break carbon-carbon single bonds? No. And remember, there's four bonds to carbon four bonds to carbon. Yes, four. And that will be your friend. Now, once you have a MIS-tal, MIK-tal, if you react it with acid and water, like in your stomach has acid and water, you break down, you get back the aldehyde and ketone, the alcohol you would have used to make that. Am I acetal or am I ketal? And remember what's attached to the carbon with the two oxygens is now attached to the carbon double bond to oxygen. Now, if you take an acetal or ketal, when our prime is hydrogen, that'd be a acetal, which I'll never ask on a test, but I like to use proper terminology. Keep your eye on the carbon with two oxygens. You get the ketone or aldehyde plus the alcohol. You would, oh, excuse me, you would have used to make that acetal or ketal. Now, these two reactions, these are the only examples I know in all of organic chemistry where you have two oxygens to the same carbon. I'll say that again. This is the only place in all of organic chemistry I should modify it where you have two oxygens 
single bonded to the same carbon and they give the same products, ketone or aldehyde and alcohol. Notice here, I have a little two in quotes. On a test, I ask, give the product or products. I never asked you to balance it. And if you want to balance it, go right ahead, put the two there. If you don't, I don't care. I'm a lazy organic chemist. And we don't balance things unless we have to do it to measure, to calculate charge weights for a reaction. Then we do. Now, next, we talk about my favorite hero in organic chemistry, Victor Grignard. And if you take an alkyl halide, X can be chlorine, bromine, iodide, magnesium, you get the Grignard reagent. And the Grignard reagent remembers RMGX, not RXMG. If you get that wrong, I'll mark it wrong. Now, what's beautiful about the Grignard reagent is when you react it with an aldehyde or ketone, first step, second step, oh no, that should be H2O. Correct it quick. I can't do it right now on a PDO. Then what you get is an alcohol. And the R triple prime bonds to the carbonyl carbon and opens it up to an alcohol. And you make that very special rare thing, a carbon-carbon single bond. And what was attached to the carbonyl carbon is still attached. All right, now, double bond between carbon oxygen and ketone or aldehyde, pi bond. Hydrogen and catalyst to break the pi bond. Each atom of the double bond, carbon oxygen, gets a hydrogen. And that's a great way of making alcohols from ketones and aldehydes. And a lot of times you can find things from mother nature, ketones, that you can make into alcohols you need. Now, this will react with carbon-carbon double bonds and H.C. Brown at Purdue, who won the Nobel Prize for work in this and other area, similar. You take lithium aluminum hydride, Li, Al, H4, second step, acid and water. You have the same thing as above, you break the pi bond and each atom of the double bond gets a hydrogen, but lithium aluminum hydride will not react with carbon-carbon double bonds or triple bonds. And both of these I've used in the lab. And finally, an area I wish I had more time to share with you, but this is a one semester course, the carbon attached to carbonyl carbon and aldehyde or ketone is called the alpha carbon. I'll never ask that on a test, but it has acidic protons, meaning you can remove them with a base, NaOH. And when you do, you form the enolate ion, which will attack a carbonyl carbon, this other aldehyde, the same one, and form that special thing, a carbon-carbon single bond, and this is called the aldol condensation. Condensed, bring two together to make one molecule, and it's called an aldol because aldehyde alcohol. And that's it. Wow, that was a mouth of a lot. Any questions? Know something? I need a pick-me-up, and so do you. So let's do something fun. Hold on one second. Did I forget to open my whiteboard? I did. Now let's do something fun. Let's play that fun game.
let's play that fun game, circle and name the functional groups, two points each. And while I'm writing them, you can get started having fun. And there's some fun for you to have. Enjoy. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Tim. And don't forget when you're done, give me like your colleagues just did, a thumbs up. All right, I better get to work. And how do you do this? Well, the easiest way is you look for what's different. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon or hydrogen atom. And right here, what do we have? I'm going to red pen we have an oxygen. And notice right here, and what is that called? Ether. Now, you don't have to put this down, but you do have to circle it and write it. Oh, wait, we're not done. Here's another uh, uh, oxygen. And notice it's this. And I should have a two there, sorry about that. And what is that? That's an aldehyde. Carbonyl, hydrogen carbons. And let's move on to B. Ooh, oxygen there. And what do we have? Carbons, OH. And that's an alcohol. We're not done, another oxygen. Double bond to carbon, carbons here and here. And what do we call that? A ketone. Remember, a ketone is not spelled with a Y, but if you pop one in there, I will never take points off. And finally, I think I threw everything but the kitchen sink in C. Ooh, oxygen here, here. Ooh, another one hidden there and one right here. Well, this one, carbonyl, carbons here, carbons here. And what do we call that? A ketone. This one, carbonyl, hydrogen, 
carbons. And that's an aldehyde. And over here, ooh, we got an oxygen here, carbons here and here. And that's an ether. And if we look over here, carbon hydroxyl group alcohol. And that's how you play that fun game. Circle and name the functional group two points each. Now, it's a fun game, but this is an important skill. If you can't identify a functional group in a molecule, how are you going to name it? You can't. If you can't identify a functional group in a molecule and what it is, how are you going to know how to react it? You can't. And if you can't identify a functional group in a product, how are you going to know? Nope, it's not the President of the United States or the Secretary General of the UN, so it can ring. One more. Stop. Oh, it listens to me. By the way, that's a Bluetooth phone. It's also amplified because I have bad hearing that I have satellites throughout uh, my house of this phone and it's hooked up to my cell phone by Bluetooth. So when I'm at home, I don't have to carry my cell phone, which is a good thing because I cut my landline about four years ago. Saved me a whole bundle of money. All right, what was I saying? Also for a reaction, if you're given the product and you're trying to determine what are the starting materials, Guess what? If you don't know what the functional group is, you're lost and you can't do it. So even though I like to say, wow, have fun with circle and name the functional groups, this is a very serious uh, key to organic chemistry, being able to identify functional groups. Because if you can't do that, you're lost. And I don't want anybody lost. All right. Any questions on material on just number two that I just won through? Or how to play that fun game, circle and name the functional group, two points each. All right. As promised, let's go to the aldehyde and ketone uh, problem set. And the first one is give the IUPAC, you know, that means the official name for the following. And if we look at A, what's different? Ooh, oxygen, double bond to carbon, hydrogen, carbon, here, aldehyde. Find the longest chain, one, two, three, four, butane, drop the E, add AL, no number, because carbonyl carbon, in an aldehyde is always one. Everybody knows that. You do too. And you have one butanol. Oh, I almost forgot something. Time out. Did anybody happen to drive by a gas station or go in a gas station and see they've got a plaque on the by the pumps that says this gasoline contains up to 10% ethanol? and ethanol is an alcohol? Or do you happen to go into a supermarket that sells liquor, beer, or wine, or into a liquor store, and happen to buy or see a bottle if you're underage, or you don't drink, uh, say vodka, and it says, contains X amount of ethanol, and that's an alcohol. Did you happen to pick up a bottle of rubbing alcohol and look and see that that contains 70 or up to 90% isopropyl alcohol, otherwise known as 2-propanol, but you'll never see that on the label. You'll see the common name, and that is an alcohol. And finally, did you happen to pick up a bottle of nail polish remover? 
and that contains the acetone, which is a ketone. Did it do any of that? All right, all right. Remember, organic chemistry is all around you. And I trust me, it won't hurt your brain to think about it when we're not together. Remember, I got the whole semester to work on you on that. All right, let's continue on. If we look at C, and remember, any page I do, if you want me to go over a problem that I didn't, ask me, and I will. If we look at this, what's different? Carbon, double bond to oxygen, carbons here and carbons here, that's a ketone. It says it right there, ketone. And how do you do this? Well, it's a cycloketone. You find the longest chain, or in this case, ring, cyclohexane. Don't forget the cyclo. And you drop the E and add O-N-E, cyclohexanone. The carbonyl carbon is one, always in a ring, always. There are no exceptions. And we have on carbon three, a methyl group, and carbon four, an isopropyl group. Now, if on a test you had put four isopropyl, three methyl, I'd still give you full credit because I'm not holding you to the IUPAC rules. Now, if we look at D, we have what's different? Carbonyl with the hydrogen carbons, aldehyde. How many carbons in the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon? Carbon double bond to oxygen, seven. Heptane, drop the E, add AL. Heptanel, you don't put a one in front because everybody knows that's number one to carbonyl carbon. If you number on carbon three as a methyl, on carbon five, ooh, another methyl. So what is two? Di, dimethyl. Since there are two methyl groups, you need two numbers, three and five. Now, if we look at F, here we have, ooh, carbon double bond to oxygen, carbons here and here, ketone. Longest chain is nine, no name. Ooh, that reminds me, I forgot to tell you importance ketone aldehyde story. Right after this one, I will. And what carbon is the carbonyl carbon when it's a cyclic, not in a ring? It has priority, so it's on carbon three. You start from this end of the chain. Well, ooh, an isopropyl group, and what carbon is it on? If this is three, it's on six. So six isopropyl. Then you need a number where the carbonyl carbon is when it's not in its array, three, and known and known. That's how you name them. Bad doctor, I forgot an interesting story, which I'll tell you right now. Now, when I first started in the industry, I worked for a company called Axo. Then Chemi became Axo Nobel. Then that division they sold off is called, now called Nurion. And right after I got my PhD and I had postdoc for a while, my first job in industry, and it was a great start for me. It worked out real well. Had a good boss initially and a lot of good things. Well, anyways, the group I was in, there were about 15 people. Friday afternoon, about 15 minutes or so before you could go home, this was flex time. Most people started at seven. Yeah, seven, and we were out of there by four o'clock. So about a quarter to four on a Friday, we'd all be sitting around in one lab, shooting the breeze, just talking everything. And I lived in Chicago then. I lived by, uh, in Rogers Park, East Rogers Park by the lake, which is a beautiful place to live. And I rented a, a garage down this alley from my apartment, because parking here, the beach area anywhere in Chicago is horrendous parking on the street. And I paid rent and it was not that much and it was so convenient. 
Well, I used to be out there like at six in the morning, get to work by seven. I walk down the alley, go to open my garage door, and somebody's dogs were leaving me presents. <laughs> and six in the morning, that's not a pleasant thing to do. So I was complaining about it at our group meeting, not meeting, just get together. And one of the older chemists said, don't you know it's in the sample room? What's the sample room you might want to ask? Well, any company, chemical company that sells chemicals, they all do. All the products they sell, they have what's called a sample room. And if you're a, a chemist who works at a company, reputable company, and you want to try one of their products for your products to make something, use it, you call up the salesman who covers your company, and could you send me a sample of this? And they do free, because this way they can get your business. And sample room, depending on how good a customer and how big the need might be, will send you anywhere from about four ounces, if it's a liquid, up to five gallons, free. And I've done that, but since we worked at that company, if we needed certain chemicals in the sample room for our own research, we just called up over there and they had it sent right over. So anyways, the chemist, and I can't remember his name, that's sad. I can picture his face, but I can't, it was decades ago, said to me, don't you know about methyl nonal ketone? I said, no. Well, it's the active ingredient in dog and animal repellent. They just don't like the smell of it. I don't know why, but they don't. And we sell it. So you can get it pure. In dog repellent, you buy it to stores. It's only about three to 5%. You can buy it 100%. So immediately I called over and this was Friday afternoon. So Monday morning or afternoon, I got a quart of methyl nonal ketone. What does it look like? Well, the IUPAC name for methyl nonal ketone is 2 and decanone. And 9 plus 2 is 11. And this is on carbon 2. Undecane is 11 undecanone, and this is the active ingredient in dog repellent. So, but instead of having 5%, I had 100%, totally pure. So what did I do? I brought home the bottle. I took a couple of plastic eyedroppers. And when I got to my garage, before I went back to my apartment, I put a line of this 100%, you know, just drip, 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 across the front of the garage door in the sally. And the next morning, guess what? No presents. The dogs didn't want to get anywhere near my garage door. And it works. When I moved in this house, I had someone whose dog left me a present. And I put some drip, drip, drip on my sidewalk. It's not hazardous. They just don't like the smell of it. Guess what? No presents. And that's my animal repellent ketone story. Ooh, I just noticed something. It's time to take a break. Let's take a five minute break and I'll see you in five minutes. And we'll continue on with aldehydes and ketones problem set. See you in five.
Time to get going. All right, let's get going. Let's continue on the problem set for ketones and aldehydes. By the way, what you see on the screen is cleverly hidden in the folder, uh, problem set answers in D2L. As name, aldehyde and ketone problem set answers. Am I sneaky or what? <laughs> Not. Anyways. Draw the condensed structure for the following organic molecule names. How do you do that? By the way, condensed, in case you forgot, you don't have to show every carbon hydrogen bond. Hexanal, AL ending. We start from the right, move left, AL aldehyde. Put an E there, hexane, six carbons, hexanal. Now, because of the way I was taught, and good habits I don't break, I have my carbonyl, number one carbon on the right. You can just as easily put it on the left. Same thing with the way I number from a chain. I always start from the right. You can start from the left too. Now, if we look at B, three octanone. Aren't you glad I don't have enunciation quizzes? But anyways, O-N-E ending, ketone. If that were an E octane, eight carbons in a chain, where's the carbonyl carbon? Carbon double bond oxygen, carbon three. You can have the carbon up or down, doesn't matter. Acetone, this is a common name. There are many ways you can draw it. Formaldehyde, here's the common name. And there's two ways you can draw it. Now, if we look at E, 2 tert butyl cyclopentanone. Start at the right, move left. O-N-E ending. Ketone. I was going to say aldehyde, which would have been wrong. Ketone. And if that were an E, cyclopentane, five carbon chain, ring. And it's got a carbonyl, carbon double bond to oxygen. That's my cyclopentanone. And carbon two. I have a T-butyl group. And a while back, students asked me, could you also do the full line when you do a ring? And I do, you can do either way. I have a PhD in organic chemistry that tells you I know they're both right. All right, let's look at F, because, uh-oh, there's a mistake. Dr. White made a mistake. And it's 2-methyl-3-N-propyl decanal. If that were AL ending, start from the right, move left, decane, AL aldehyde, 10 carbons, aldehyde. Now, on carbon-3 is the N-propyl. I have an isopropyl. Oops. Well, I did warn you the first day. I can make mistakes. So there goes my perfect score on this problem set. And then on carbon two is a methyl group. On G, I got it right. All right, let's look at some reactions. Give the organic product or products for following reactions. Here we have ethanol, you know, that's alcohol. Did I tell you that's a tiny little molecule in beer, wine, and hard spirits, you know, the good stuff. Grey Goose Vodka, Absolute Vodka, uh, Canadian Club, not vodka. That gets you inebriated if you consume too much. Don't, please. And never drive, please. I used to live years ago about two and a half miles down a major uh, high, uh, road, Algonquin, from a bar that had a 4 p.m. license. And if I was driving home to my apartment like one in the morning, there would always be drunks coming out of that bar or later. And eventually the county police and the city police would be there and arrest these people, which they deserve. Anyways, primary alcohol, oxidized aldehyde, R is methyl, you get ethanol. 
secondary alcohol, oxidize it, lose the hydrogen there, hydrogen there, you get a cyclic ketone. Same thing here, C and D, I just put scarier uh, R groups, and you get aldehyde or ketone. Now, if we look at E, look for what's different. Benzene ring. Ooh. Oh, by the way, sometimes my software likes to left justify the hydrogens. H3C is the same as CH3. I usually catch it. And it's, I, even when I have it set for uh, right justified, it'll still like to do that. And I miss it, which I did here. And we have an acid chloride, carbonyl, R group chlorine, aluminum trichloride, and here you make an aromatic ketone. Benzene ring, carbonyl, what's our methyl? And then for F and G, all I've done is change the R group. Now, if we look at H, now it's time to play, name that functional group. First molecule, we have a aldehyde, and it could have been a ketone. Then we have here alcohol, and above the arrow, H plus acid catalyst. And what happens, keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon, carbons or hydrogens bond that are still there, our primer H, our double prime. Since you only have one molecule of an alcohol, you have, guess what? And hemi acetal OH and OR on the carbon was the carbonyl carbon. In this case, our prime is H, our double prime is methyl. Here's my carbonyl carbon. I'll draw it, put the H in methyl. Then I'll have OH, O, and what's our ethyl? And here I do it with a ketone, same thing. Now, if you look at B, we have, what's this? It's a ketone, cyclopentanone. Ooh, two, that's unusual. See a coefficient number in front of a molecule. We have two molecules of, what is this? An alcohol acid catalyst, and you get an acetal or ketal. What was attached to carbonyl carbon, our prime H, or H and our double prime still there, two oxygens in our groups. And here's my carbonyl carbon. Now it has two oxygens. My R from the alcohol is isopropyl. And C is the same way. Now, if we take, in this case, an acetal or ketal, two oxygens, single bonds, the same carbon, each one has R groups on it. What's attached to that carbon? Hydrogen or R prime or R double prime. And R double prime is still attached to that carbon. That becomes the ketone or aldehyde you would have used to make this molecule. And you get the alcohol. And if you want to put two, you can. You don't have to, which is why I have a little post. What's R prime? Hydrogen. What's our double prime ethyl? You get this aldehyde. What's our methyl? You get this alcohol. And I have two more examples of the same reaction. And if we look at F, I have these two oxygen single bond to the carbon in the ring. And what's attached to that carbon stays attached, and that becomes double bond to oxygen. And then on the oxygens, my carbons are per R become the alcohol. Remember, the carbon bond to the oxygen in an OR is the carbon with the hydroxyl group. The carbon bond to the oxygen in OR is the carbon with the hydroxyl group. And here, if I take a ketone or aldehyde reactor with hydrogen, a catalyst, 
I break the pi bond, each atom of the double bond gets a hydrogen, you get an alcohol. If you write it this way or this way, either way works the same for me. And here I just change the R groups. Now in D, we have lithium aluminum hydride, first step, second step, H plus acid, water. If you take, and what is this? Again, play that fun game, circle and name the functional group. In this case, it's not two points each, but I'll help you get three points on the test. It's a ketone, could have been an aldehyde, lithium aluminum hydride, acid, water, second step. You break the pi bond, each atom of the double bond, carbon oxygen, gets a hydrogen. And you could write it this way or this way for this. And E, same thing. What's our prime hydrogen? What's our double prime methyl? And this is probably the most expensive way I know to make ethanol. Now, one thing I just noticed I don't have. So let's, I'm gonna let you have some fun. Oh, one thing, I want to try something. You know how I always get things frozen out? I just did it to myself. Nope, I didn't. I'm thinking it doesn't happen in my chem, general chemistry, but because of I use the whiteboard a lot more, I just deleted everything. So there's less in that file. Let's see if it makes a difference. And why don't you try this one? Give the organic product or products for the following. I'll help you out. Hey, have fun. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Megan. Everybody done now? Thank you, Tam. Notice, Tam, I haven't put it M and a Y at the end of your name. I've been careful. All right, let's take a look at this. What's different? Ooh, bromion of carbon, alkyl halide, magnesium. You get the Grignard. What's R? This. You break carbon, carbon single bonds? No, four carbons. Which carbon has the halogen, the end carbon? That will be the magnesium, and the bromine is bonded to the magnesium. There are four bonds to carbon. And that's what you, oh, we got to do another one of these. What would I react with magnesium to make this compound? Psst. 
this is really sophisticated organic chemistry you're doing. Hopefully it's not painful. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Dan. And Joe's done too, so I better get to work. Isn't it amazing? Aren't you proud of yourself? How much you've learned? Could you have done this six months ago? Probably not. All right, let's take a look at this. What's different? Ooh, magnesium and iodine and a carbon? That's a Grignard. Remember, X equals chlorine, bromine, or in this case, iodine. And what's my R group? This. And how do you make a Grignard? React an alkyl halide plus magnesium. Well, what's our R group? And the carbon with the Grignard is the carbon with the halogen. And what is that? Iodine. And that's how you do it. Any questions? Well, let's continue on with the problem set. Now, let's have some fun with the Grignard. And if we look at A, the question is, give the organic product or products for the following. And what do we have? Ooh, a ketone. Remember, look for what's different. Then up here on one, methyl, CH3, magnesium iodide. Ooh, it's a Grignard, second step, H plus is acid and water. And a Grignard, remember, you make that carbon-carbon single bond. This is a reagent that allows you to do that. The R triple prime bonds to the carbonyl carbon and it opens it up to an alcohol. What was on there, R prime and our, our hydrogen, and our double prime is still on that carbon. So if we look at A, and it doesn't matter what you call R prime or R double prime, you have a methyl and an ethyl. Here's my carbon that will still be there, my attached to that will be our triple prime methyl, and that carbon, you have a hydroxyl group. You can write it this way or this way. Either way would work for me. And if you look at B, same thing, ketone, uh, aldehyde now, Grignard, and what's attached to the carbonyl carbon, H and methyl, Still there, you now have a hydroxyl group. What's my R group? Triple prime ethyl, and you've made that. Remember, the carbon with the Grignard is the carbon attached to carbon with the hydroxyl group. So here I have a ketone. I have this Grignard. Oh, by the way, Grignards have IUPAC in common names too. I'm not teaching you that this semester but that would be isopropyl magnesium iodide. And then it's taxed to carbonyl carbon. What's attached at the ring is still there. You get a hydroxyl group and an isopropyl. And truthfully, I don't know of an easy way to make this molecule except this reaction. And that reaction makes it very easy. All right, next we talked about the aldol condensation. Remember, shh, don't tell anybody, please. My special gift to you is, in organic chemistry, we normally wouldn't do this. If I you see two of the same aldehyde with sodium hydroxide, I forgot on the problem set to put water, takes a proton uh, H off the alpha carbon, the carbon bonded to the, uh, carbonyl carbon, and this bonds attacks to the other carbonyl carbon of the same aldehyde and opens it up to an alcohol. Notice you lose one hydrogen, 
you form a carbon-carbon single bond. And here, here's tax that, and you get that. When R is a benzene ring, attacks that, you make this molecule, which if you notice is quite unique and very, from two simple aldehydes, you make a very complex molecule. And same thing here, the R groups come along for a ride. All right, let me remind you, on test two and also the final, I will never ever give a synthesis problem with a aldol condensation. I will never ever on a test number two or the final, give a synthesis problem using a Grignard reagent with a ketone or aldehyde. And that's my gift to you. And finally, big gift. With the four reactions forming an acetal or hemiacetal, reacting an acetal or ketal with acid water, or hemiacetal or ketal with acid water, those I will never give a synthesis problem on. It's cruel, unusual punishment. I think still today it's outlawed by the Supreme Court to do to students. All right, any questions on chapter on aldehydes and ketones problem set? I'm all open for questions. In case you haven't heard it in a while, I'll say it again. Remember in my class, but don't look at my bald spot, you look, my class, there's no such thing as a dumb question. And don't forget, if you're having problems tonight from 5 to 6.15, I'll have my office hour. So stop by. Any questions? Going once, going twice. Well, in that case, we're done with that. So it's time for a new chapter. And this new chapter, I love my whistle. I've got four of these. The company in Germany is no longer in business. These never leave my house. Never. Because I don't want to lose them. You can't get them anymore. And the ones they make are no near to quality that German company made. But anyways, it's a new chapter. And this chapter will not be on test number two. It will be on test number three coming down the road, but I'm gonna get going on it. First of all, let me close this. Now, this new chapter, I got to warn you about a couple of things. One is, it's an area I worked in an industry, so I know quite well. Two, we'll be talking about something that's real, real, real sour. Ooh. And we'll talk about things you'd never thought Dr. White would get into, but I can, and I do. And finally, I'll tell you about a couple of things. One, something that tastes good, something else that smells really, really good. And finally, I'll tell you a personal story about myself and my mother, which I'm not proud of, but it's true. And it deals with organic chemistry in this chapter. So, wow, this sounds like a fun-filled chapter. Let's get going. And that new chapter is carboxylic acids and their derivatives. What's a carboxylic acid? Well, it's a new functional group I'm going to teach you. It's not new. It's been around for eons. But for you, it's new. And I'll never ask you, what does a carboxylic acid contain? But it contains a carbonyl, 
group and a hydroxyl group. And that's how it got its name, carboxylic acid. Now, what is a carbonyl or carboxylic acid? Now, here's two ways of writing it. And my software doesn't like putting in the carbons. And this is a carboxylic acid has a carbonyl group, carbon double bond to oxygen. And to that same carbon, it has a hydroxyl group and an R group. Now you'll also sometimes see it written like this or like this. Dr. White doesn't like this later. And sometimes even this chapter, I'll write it like that. What that means is this carbon has two oxygens, And one of the oxygens has a hydrogen, and that's a carboxylic acid. Now, one of the things we'll be doing throughout the next number of weeks is here's a new functional group. I'll introduce you to it, so I better introduce you. Everybody, say hello to carboxylic acid. Well, you've been introduced. Then I'll talk about the IUPAC rules for naming that new functional group. And then I'll talk about where do you find it in your daily life. And then I'll also talk about how do you make it and how do you react it. All right. So first of all, I better put a carboxylic acid so you can see it. And if you notice, this is a carboxylic acid. Our group, carbonyl, carbon double bond oxygen, and to that same carbon, a hydroxyl group, OH. And this is a carboxylic acid. Wow, I'm popular today. someone else and I think that's the final rank. My answering machine will pick it up. Actually, the thing on my cell phone Verizon service will answering will pick it up. All right, so we have a carboxylic acid. How do we proceed? Well, let's take a look. Find the longest carbon chain, which includes the carbonyl carbon, of a carboxylic acid. Remember, carbonyl carbon is carbon double bond to oxygen. Name that as an alkane. And now you drop the E at the end of the alkane and add the letters OIC and the word acid. You drop the E at the end of the alkane name and you add OIC in the word acid. Now, this is important. Like an aldehyde, the carbonyl carbon of a carboxylic acid is always number one. Therefore, you need no number. Again, the carbonyl carbon of a carboxylic acid is always number one, and you don't can't have, don't need a number. By the way, you can't have a carboxylic acid like an aldehyde in a ring. Name and number all the other uh, substituents as IUPAC rules like we've done for substituents. Now, this one, you don't have to know. When the carboxylic acid group is attached to a ring, the ending carboxylic acid is the name to the cycloalkane name. I'll never give you that. It's not technically in a ring, but it's named. So let's get the word. We look at this one, 
what's the longest chain? One, two, three, four, five. That's pentane. Drop the E, add O, I, C, and the word acid. And I'm done. That's pentanoic acid. I'll do one more for you, and then I'll let you try the following. I'll do this one. What's different? Ooh, carbonyl and a hydroxyl group to the same carbon with our group. That's a carboxylic acid. And while you're catching up, ooh, we're going to talk about hot dog and hamburger condiments in this section, this chapter too, like ketchup, relish, mustard. And now, what's the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon? One, two, three, four or one, two, three, four. So four is longest chain, butane. It's a carboxylic acid. I'll drop the E and OIC and the word acid. Now, as soon as I say butanoic acid, this is all spoken for. And what's left over? Oh, it's your old friend, the methyl group. Remember the carbonyl carbon, everybody knows is carbon one. And now the methyl group, what carbon is it on? Three. So this would be three methyl butanoic acid. Aren't you really glad I don't do pronunciation quizzes? I know one instructor who did. I wouldn't. All right. Now you can write the carboxylic acid on the left, but I learned on the right and good habits, I don't change. So the question is, give the IUPAC name for the following molecule. While you're doing that, I'm going to check something because I was wondering why I'm getting all these phone calls. I'm back. I found out who the who's been calling me. When you join us, when you graduate from a college or we're in a fraternity, they never lose track of you if they think they can either get information or money from you. And that's what that was. All right, let's get to work. What's different? What's not a carbon? What's not a hydrogen? What's not a carbon carbon single bond? Ooh, look at this carbon. Carbonyl, hydroxyl group, carbons.
and that's the carboxylic acid. And how many carbons in the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I went five and then down here would be six, which is greater, seven or six. Isn't the math tough in my class? Well, hopefully I'll pick seven. Seven, what's the IUPAC name for that? And the answer is heptane. It's a carboxylic acid. Drop the E at OIC and the word acid. And am I done? No, it's your old friend, the methyl group. Now, excuse me, what carbon is it on? Carbon five, so that'd be five methyl heptanoic acid. Oh, let's do one more. I'm gonna move for one more. And there you go. There's your one more. What well, give the IUPAC name for the following molecule? I hope you're all having a good time learning organic chemistry. It's really a lot of fun. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Tam. And thank you, Joe. All right, time for me to get to work. What's the IUPAC name? Well, what's different? Carbon double bond to oxygen here with a hydroxyl group. And that is a carboxylic acid. And so how many carbons along this chain? One, two, three, four, five, six, oh, I did seven again. I should have put eight, but I did seven. So that's heptane. Drop the E, add OIC, and the word acid, heptanoic acid. Carbonyl carbon is number one. And carbon two, oh, it's my favorite, the T-butyl group. And if you put down tert butyl, that's okay too. Now, when it comes to nomenclature, there are two skills. One is here's the structure, give the IUPAC name. The other is here's the name, draw the structure. So if I were to ask you, sometime in the future, three points each, three isopropyl octanoic acid, what do you do? Well, you start from the right and you see OIC acid, that's a carboxylic acid.
And if this were an E octane, eight carbons. Now, I like to start from here on the right with my carbonyl carbon of the carboxylic acid. You could just easily put it over here. I won't because good habits I don't break. And that's my octanoic acid. Carbonyl carbon is one, therefore it's two, three. I have an isopropyl and carbon three, three carbon center carbon. And now I know there are four bonds to carbon. So let's see how quickly I can put in my hydrogens. That's how quickly, and that's how you do it. Remember, start from the right and move left. Oh, I see acid tells you carboxylic acid. If you replace the OIC and acid with an E, octane, that tells you how many carbons. Don't forget that includes the carbonyl carbon and then the rest of the alkyl groups you know how to do. And it's your turn. Why don't you draw the structure for two propanoic acid or two methyl propanoic acid? Oh, I almost forgot to say methyl. Actually, I did. All right, Joe, how'd you log in twice? Oh, no, it's the twilight zone. We have Joe squared. No, it's his doable. I was. Yeah. yeah, I just refreshed my browser just to join oh. in again. Because the, the audio was cutting out, so I refreshed, and apparently there's three of me now. All right, are you hearing me now? Test. Yeah, I can hear you. Test. Number nine, number nine. It's all working now. All right. Don't forget to mute yourself. Okay. Oh, let's try something. That's interesting. When you did that, I can't mute you, so don't be quiet. <laughs> or totally log off when you next break and log back on. But let's continue on. Ah, there, I think it righted its nope. But anyways, let's get to work. That's interesting. How do we write this? You start at the right, move left. OIC in the word acid. And now, if that were an E, propane, oh, you know that, three carbons. But it's a carboxylic acid. And now on carbon two is a methyl group. And that's, I, oh, let's do one more. Practice is good for your grade, and I get what I want. You learn this stuff. And why don't you try writing 3N-butyl 
decanoic acid, or I should say drawing the structure. And Joe, if you can hear me, give me a thumbs up because whatever it was, it looks like Zoom has, uh, you were double on my screen. It was interesting. All right, I'm glad you're back on track. I see Joe's done. I see Megan's done. I see Tam's done, so I better get to work. All right, how did you go with this to know what to draw? You start from the right, move left. OIC acid, that's a carboxylic acid. And if this were an E, OIC acid and E, be decane, 10 carbons. And at one end, and I like doing the right end, you can do the left end, but good habits I don't break, I have my carboxylic acid group. This is carbonyl carbon is one, two, three and carbon three and butyl is four carbons like that. And now I get to have fun putting in my hydrogens. And that's 3N-butyl decanoic acid. And that's how you do nomenclature for carboxylic acids. But there's some common names and one that also became IUPAC. And does everybody see on their screen, let me change the magnification. Formic acid, acetic acid, benzoic acid. Thank you, Megan. And if I look at the clock, you're going to have to wait five minutes. Ooh, a cliffhanger from Dr. White to wait and find out what those are. I'll see you in five. Let's take a five minute break. I'll be back in five, and hopefully, you too.
Time to get going again. Welcome back. Home stretch. Hang in there. Mondays are a long day, but not in the summer. I have three lectures, like two lectures like this week, and also lab and everything. It's a lot of lecturing in the summer. All right, welcome back. I left you hanging. What are those molecules? Well, let's find out. Now, there's some common names for molecules you could, you should know. Let's look at formic acid. You should know the structure of formic acid is this molecule. And I guess the IUPAC name, which I have to think about because nobody ever uses it, would be methanoic acid, but everybody calls it formic acid. Now, how many of you out there have ever heard of the fire ants? Have you ever heard of fire ants? And those are ants that have a defensive weapon. I hope they stay out of Illinois. I think they're down south in Texas, Arizona. I don't know about it in Texas and maybe some other southern states. And they have a defensive weapon, which they spray at an animal or whoever is attacking them. And they're called fire ants because if you get that on you, you feel like you've just been burned by a fire, something hot. Now, what is that defensive weapon? It's a heated solution of water and formic acid. Now, I've never done this, unfortunately, in a lab at the other school. I had a student get acid on his forearm. And why do they call that fire ants? That stuff, certain heated carboxylic acids, acids will burn, damage your skin. And when it does that, they call it an acid burn because it gives the person who has it, and I had a student who did do this accidentally, feels like you've been burned very badly. And the damage to your skin afterward looks like somebody took a piece of hot metal and burned you. And that's why they call it an acid burn. And the fire ants use formic acid and hot water that they create in their body. How, I don't know, I'm not a, what's somebody who studies ants and insects, an insectologist, that's not right, but anyways, a scientist, a biologist who studies ants and other insects, and they create that defensive weapon. And you should know, if I ask on a test, draw the structure for formic acid, remember this is test three, well, that's the structure. Now let's talk about acetic acid. The common name is ethanoic acid, which nobody ever uses. Everybody calls acetic acid. Now the structure of acetic acid is this molecule. That's one R in a carboxylic acid is methyl. And I bet all of you have acetic acid in your house. No, I don't. I'd know if I had acetic acid. Well, you do. Because one place you find acetic acid, if you take about 4% acetic acid and about 96% water, mix them together, you get a homogeneous solution, same throughout. We have a name for that. Vinegar. Vinegar is just a dilute solution of acetic acid and water. And that gives it that tart taste or sour taste, not tart, sour. I guess tart, you could use sour. And small carboxylic acids have sour taste to it. If you've ever done shots of vinegar, which I never have, and if you ever go to a party and do shots of vinegar, I doubt it. But if you taste vinegar, ooh, that's sour. And some uh, ethnic dishes that are sweet and sour, they use vinegar 
to get the sour part. Now, if you're familiar with vinegar, there are different types. There's white vinegar, which is not named after me. And then there's things like uh, champagne vinegar, wine vinegars. You can also get rice wine vinegar. Uh, if you've ever had rice wine vinegar, my favorite is the brand called Barucan. It's a really good Japanese. And they taste slightly different because other minor things in there that give it the taste like uh, apple cider vinegar, I really like. Uh, I have a gallon in my house always for cooking and things like, I make a lot of pickled vegetables with that, which are really good, dangerously good. If you've never had uh, pickled onions, if you've never had pickled red peppers, you're missing a lot in life. And they all have acetic acid and water and some smaller amounts, minor amounts of different flavorings that give them the different taste. So next time you're in your kitchen, pick up that bottle of vinegar and you'll see it has acetic acid in there. Now, one thing I should also mention, if you look in your kitchen, if you have ketchup or, and mustard or mustard, if you also have uh, relish, especially in Chicago and you know, the green relish that glows in the dark for your hot dogs and super green stuff. If you look on the label, you'll see the first ingredient is vinegar, which means your ketchup and mustard contain vinegar, which contains acetic acid. So next time you pick up a bottle of ketchup or mustard, you'll be holding something with acetic acid in. Now the last structure, the common name is also the IUPAC name. Because IUPAC and their infinite wisdom said, oh, benzoic acid, we're not gonna change those organic chemists. Because this has been called for eons, benzoic acid. And benzoic acid is when the R group in a carboxylic acid is a benzene ring. So formic acid, R is hydrogen. That's fire ants. Acetic acid, and this one you really should know, really important. Hold on, I got to make a better arrow. That's better. And that's acetic acid when R is methyl. And that's found in vinegar, which you should know, and mustard and ketchup. And then benzoic acid when the R group is a benzene ring. And for acetic and formic, I'll never ask you what's the common name for a compound, but I will ask you draw the following. For benzoic acid, since that is the IUPAC name, I can ask you to give the IUPAC name for that or draw it. All right, next slide. I'm going to switch this screen off, uh, switch the switch click to off position. Will this be on test number three? And we can have, remember, there's a carbon here. When the carbonyl carbon plus R is large, very big, we call these long chain uh, carboxylic acids or just acids. And later on, we'll talk about these and they're also called fatty acids because you get them from fats and oils. And the switch is totally off. Lauric acid is 12 carbons. The carbonyl carbon plus R, palmitic is 16, 
Sterikazate, Oleikazate with a double bond. And I worked for a company for a number of years where I was laboratory manager in the United States. And they also had plants in Europe. And they, and also in the Far East, also known as the Asian Basin, they made carboxylic acids, especially stearic and oleic acid. And the one plant we had here in Chicago and the research center there too, we made oleic and stearic acid a tune of about hmm, a couple million pounds per week of each. Yep, million pounds of each. I'll talk more when we get into fats and oils about that. Now, switch is still off, but warning, warning. I'm going to talk about things you never thought Dr. White would talk about, but I'm talking about the organic chemistry part of it, not more any moralistic part about it. I'm just talking this organic chemistry in our daily life. Now, how many of you ever worked out real hard? All of a sudden you get that burning sensation in your muscles from working out too much. And if you ever saw the movie, uh, movie Running Man with Arnold Schwarzenegger, his line was there, no pain, no gain, which I guess some people used to think when you work out, you don't feel any pain, you're not going to build up the muscle. Don't know if that's true. Oh, what's that pain? What's causing that pain? Your muscle. Well, it's a carboxylic acid. And it's lactic acid. The switch is totally off. I'll never ask you what's the structure of lactic acid. But since it's in our, our body makes this, and I guess from what I've been told from a long ago from a physical therapist when I was going to one for problems I was having, that when you get that, that's your body's way of saying stop. Mother nature stop sign. Now, lactic acid causes that. Notice lactic acid has two functional groups. Now, this is one way of writing a carboxylic acid. I could have also, these are the same structures. I'm just writing the carboxylic acid out fully. And notice you have an alcohol hydroxyl group on the alpha carbon. Remember, carbon attached to carbonyl, even in carboxylic acids, is called the alpha carbon. And you have a small little carboxylic acid. Now, why does that cause muscle burn? I guess you're getting some sort of acid burn. But now it's time to talk about a little hobby Dr. White has. I don't know if it's a hobby. It's a nice mental exercise. When I see a product that's being sold, and I wonder, how do they make that? Especially when it's small, a product, which is a mixture of substances, otherwise known as chemicals. Now remember, I'm only talking about the organic pro, uh, chemical chemistry concepts involved, nothing else, like anything moralistic. Now, how many of you are familiar with what's called personal gel made by a company called KY? And it's KY Jelly. And it's a personal gel for certain personal activities. I'll let you figure out what they mean, what those are. Now, KY, a number of years ago, came out with a new product that was called a personal warming gel or lubricant. And it's used for some personal activities between a man and a woman. In. And the way it worked was, if you put it on a certain part of your body, this will cause a warming sensation to, how should I say this politely, improve the activity you are undergoing. I wonder, how did they do the warming gel? So I happened to be in either a Target or a, um, a Walmart, and I saw the product, I picked it up. I looked at the label, and I'm Dr. White's an organic chemist, and I know organic chemistry. Nah, that's not going to do anything. Ooh, and guess what was in there? Lactic acid. And what it was doing was they put a tiny amount in there, and it was giving you a very mild acid burn on parts where I don't think you'd ever want an acid burn, but 
After a while, they changed the formulation and replaced it with a very long chain or high molecular weight alcohol. And what happens is the moisture on your skin interacts with the alcohol, those long chain ones, and that causes what's called heat of hydration by forming hydrogen bonds. And that also warmed up your certain parts of your body that were used in person, certain personal things where you needed a personal lubricant. Now, a couple of years later, they came out with a product called Fire and Ice. I could figure out from their label what was the fire. It took me a while to figure out how they got the cooling or ice sensation. I did though. Isn't organic chemistry knowledge fun? So that's lactic acid. Let's talk about another carboxylic acid mother nature has made, and that's citric acid. Remember, it switches off, this won't be on a test. And citric acid, the way my software wrote it is this way. I can write it this way. If you look at the structure of citric acid, and again, I'll never ask this on a test, but I thought you'd like to learn about it. It has not only one, two, but three carboxylic acids in there. Now, how many of you have ever bitten to a lemon? It's real sour, right? Or if you ever had real sour concentrated lemonade? And you drink it, and you go, ooh, is that sour? Well, what's making that sour taste? It's citric acid. And that's because it's a small mo molecule, low molecular weight, and it's got not one, not two, but three carboxylic acids. And that's the molecule in lemons that causes the sour taste. Now, if you've ever tasted limes, it's got a sour taste, but less sour than lemons. Why? Because it has less citric acid in there. So citric acid, by the way, you can buy as a white salad. And if I had the right uh, credit line, I was had my own company, I could order 50,000 pounds of citric acid delivered to my company. Now, how many of you are familiar with Halloween, by the way, Remember, Halloween's coming up. Don't forget to get the good candy, you know, like Kit Kat or Nestle's Crunch, my favorites. Oh, I just thought of something sad. If we were face to face, the since Halloween doesn't occur on a day, I think it's Sunday uh, this year, when we have class, the first class after Halloween, I bring everybody enough candy so you'll get a couple of pieces of candy. And I think I told you I do Halloween candy by my golden rule of Halloween. And that is I don't give to people Halloween candy that I wouldn't want for myself, which means I usually bring Kit Kats or Nestle Crunch. That's the best Halloween. Now, how many of you are familiar in the last about 10 years, there's been a trend in children's candy that the more sour it is, the more the young kids like it. I don't like that stuff. Eh. No, not my thing. But they must be selling a lot of it. And how do they make it? They make the candy and they just put in a lot of citric acid. And they don't squeeze it from lemons or limes. They make it in a plant, chemical plant. And that's citric acid. Switch is still off. Uh, some physical properties of Carboxylic acids, notice Dr. White's a lazy organic chemist. I didn't even put the word carboxylic there. I should have. And the lower carboxylic acids, a lot of them have sharp, unpleasant odors, uh, lower molecular weight. For low MW means molecular weight. They have a sour taste. They're polar. I'll teach more about that later in the semester. That means they're soluble in water, some extent. 
and a higher boiling points they have because they can hydrogen bond. And like I said, the lower molecular weight are soluble. Now, what do I mean by sharp, unpleasant odors? One lab I managed, a chemist dropped the bottle. And this is a liquid at room temperature of this molecule. I think it was about a, a pint bottle or half a quart, maybe a little more than a pint. It got all over this floor. And I went and helped clean up. And the bad thing is butanoic acid smells like upchuck, if you know what I mean. Oh, it's awful. And when I got home, or actually before I got home, when I worked in the chemical industry, I always had to change of clothes in my car in case I had to. And the shirt and the pants I was wearing got thrown out. I wasn't even going to wash it. They reeked. And I told that chemist, don't you ever drop a bottle like that again. I'll make you clean it up on your own. And I won't be a happy camper. And you never want to see Dr. White upset. I don't want to see me upset. All right, let's talk about the acidity of carboxylic acids. Why are they called the carboxylic acid? Well, Carboxylic acids associated in water deal what's called the carboxylate anion. I'll show you that. And H3O plus is the hydronium ion. Now, quick review switches on. In chemistry, HA is a standard acid, B is a way of saying any base. And what's an acid? Hopefully you remember. An acid is a proton donor. What's a proton? H plus. So anything that you call an acid is a proton donor. It gives up H plus. Sort of like, I'm an acid here, take my H plus. If I'm a strong acid, I don't even ask, I just give it to you. Well, carboxylic acids are acids. And this is my acidic proton. And notice in water, this goes to water to form the hydronium ion. And this is called the carboxylate. I can spell it right, carboxylate anion. And later on, I'll talk more about carboxylate anions. And as I said, this is called the carboxylic acid because an acid is a proton donor and the proton that is donated is that hydrogen on the oxygen. Now, what makes a carboxylic acid acidic? And I have a note to myself, note the acidity of ethanol versus acetic acid. So let's try that. Here we have ethanol, and the equilibrium for this is this. It really doesn't go to this. Remember acid, and we're looking at that hydrogen proton on the oxygen. It really doesn't go that far. This is a very, very strong acid. This is almost a very tiny, tiny, tiny weak acid. Uh, but if we have acetic acid, Now the equilibrium is more to the right. Now, why does this happen? And that's because of resonance. The more resonance structures you can draw something, the more stable it is. 
So this electrons can go there, this can go there, and I can draw another resonance structure. And you haven't flipped it over. These are separate and they exist at the same time. And that makes this more stable. Therefore, it's going to go more to the side, give up more of this. And that's why carboxylic acids are acidic and alcohols are not. The effect of resin stabilization of the carboxylate anion. I won't ask that on test, but at least now you know why. For those reading the book, chapter 10, part five, I'm skipping. All right, let's talk about, if you take an acid and base, this is a straight acid base neutralization reaction and you get a salt. Well, if you take carboxylic acid, I'm gonna change this. And I'll rewrite it underneath. Or M can be sodium, potassium, or lithium. Actually, it can be other things, but, and this is going to be M plus O minus carbonyl. And therefore, if I take a carboxylic acid, and react it with a base, MOH, like any sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, or lithium hydroxide, I get a carboxylate anion. I'll try and spell it correctly this time. And plus water. And you know, I don't ask for inorganic stuff, so you can Ignore that if you want. If not, you can look at it. So this is how you make a carboxylate anion. And sometimes you'll see I'll have a solvent. You'll do that in water. And I could also put the sodium hydroxide on top there. And the question is, what's the organic product or products for the following? And what's different here? Ooh, carbonyl with a hydroxyl group that has the same carbon, carbon is here, carboxylic acid. Reacting with a base, hydroxide, M can be sodium, lithium, or potassium. And what do you get? An acid-base reaction to form a salt. Remember, this is test number three material. Oh, one thing, Dr. White has a bad habit or just peculiarity that I always circle the negative charges and never circle the positive. You don't have to circle either one. In fact, I'm going to mention something right now after I do this. So what's my R group? Ethyl. You break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No, three carbons, three carbons. Here's my carbonyl, oxygen minus, what's M, sodium. And there are three bonds to carbon, four bonds to carbon. And I can put that in there. Now, a couple of years ago, I had a 170 student who said, are you gonna take off points if you don't put in the charges or I did on a test? And so why, I got this right. I said, no, you didn't show the charges. And I said, well, I don't have to. And I said, well, if you can prove to me why, I'll give you your points back. And he proved to me why. How did he do that? He said, what's this? Nickel, sodium chloride. But isn't that really 
I said, yes. Well, how come you don't show the charges there? Well, you don't have to. And he said, well, then I don't have to on your test. I said, you're right. And I gave him the points. And ever since then, if you wanted to write it this way, I'll accept it and give you full credit. But good habits, I don't break. And I'll always show the charges. And it's your turn. Give the organic product or products for a following reaction. While you're doing that, I need a replacement bottle of water. I'll be right back. Good news, I'm back. I've got about five or six of these in my refrigerator. So they're always available cold. And if we had been in ECC face to face outside our classroom where I teach 170, about 10 feet away from the door is a drinking fountain. And pre COVID 19, I would go out and fill my bottle. Anybody, quick question. Any of you been on campus this semester at ECC? Have you, Megan? Do they have the drinking fountains covered up or they're available? Or don't you remember? I think you can only get like a water bottle filled up. A what? A water bottle filled up, like you can't drink from it. How do they stop people from the regular drinking fountains? Or did they fill up? You haven't been in a building where they had the regular drinking fountains. I don't think I have. All right. Well, building M does. I wonder if they have to put in new drinking fountains. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's do this problem. And if we look at this, what's different? What's not carbon? What's not hydro? Ooh, oxygen, oxygen. We have a carbonyl with a hydroxyl group and carbons carboxylic acid, ooh, lithium hydroxide. Remember M can be lithium, which it is potassium or sodium. And we get a carboxylate anion. What's our isopropyl? Have my carbonyl oxygen, O minus, and what's M? Lithium. I know there are four bonds to carbon. And there you go. Oops, not two there. There we go. And, oh, let's do one more. On test three, like test two, I'll have a couple of synthesis. All right, what's going on? Uh-oh, I think I just locked me up. I don't know what's happening. I might have a bad corrupted file.
All right, sorry about that. All right, let's get back to where we were. What would you react with NaOH sodium hydroxide to make that molecule? Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Joe, thank you. Everybody done? Thank you. All right. What's different here? Well, benzene ring, but that's not going to react with sodium hydroxide. So I'm going to just call that R. Oh, I got a carbonyl, oxygen, O minus, and a cation. And a plus, which I'll do this. And this is sodium hydroxide, which I can go like this, where M can be lithium, <clears throat> excuse me, potassium or sodium. And what do I start with? A carboxylic acid. And what's my R group? Benzene ring. So what do I have here? Benzoic acid. So if you react this with this, you'll get this carboxylate anion. Now, one of the things I've been doing more and more this semester now is saying or answering the question, why am I learning this stuff? And the obvious answer is you want to get into a program or school like nursing or a dietitian, and you need a good grade in organic chemistry. But why learn this? Well, it turns out this molecule you just made has a name, and I have a slide later on, but the name of it is I'll teach you later on how to get this name. Sodium benzoate. And if you pick up a can of pop, remember Dr. White's from the Chicagoland area, and stuff in a bottle or a can that's carbonated and non-alcoholic and tastes good, like Dr. Pepper or Werner's pop, has in there near the end of the label, sodium benzoate. And this is a preservative in pop that allows you to keep that can in your house for a while without worrying about something bad happening in that can. Now, how does that do that? I have no idea. I'm an organic chemist, but I do know it's in there. And now you know how to make it. All right, now this is a reaction of an acid and a base. Remember, carboxylic acid is an acid. 
sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide is a base. And technically, actually not more than technically, this is a salt, a carboxylate anion is a salt. Let's look at a very special base. And that's sodium bicarbonate, NaHCO3, which you also know as baking powder. How many of you, if you buy or your parents buy the small little red can called Calmet baking powder, or I haven't seen it around here in a long time. There used to be, you could get a yellow can, same size of baking powder with the bizarre name, Gabbler Girl, that's actually made in Indiana. How they came up with that name, I've never looked it up, but it is weird. Or you can go to your local Myers or others and get the generic baking powder. And essentially what it is is sodium bicarbonate. And this is a weak base. Switch is on, by the way. But this is a strong acid, and you have an acid-base reaction. And you'll get the carboxylate anion, but you get water and carbon dioxide, CO2. And everybody see the arrow right here? That means this is a gas it's given off as a gas. Let's take a look at why this happens. And this part the switches off, but I thought you'd be interested in it. Well, this is an acid, but what's the structure of sodium bicarbonate really look like? This. And when that reacts, it transfers a proton to make this plus this. And I'm going to put it in brackets because you can't isolate it. When you put something in brackets like this, you can't isolate it. This has the name carbonic acid, which you don't have to know, but I'm telling you anyways. I'll never ask what you're seeing on the slide on the test. And if you notice, I have a H, oxygen, and another H. Ooh, what's H? H and O, H2O. What's left behind are two oxygens and a carbon. This immediately breaks down to give you CO2 and water. And that's why this happens. So let's try this out. Now here, I'm going to ask something else. And now I'd ask you to give all products for the following. And I'm going to do this one first. What do we have here? Carboxylic acid sodium bicarbonate, and what do I get? A carboxylate anion plus water plus carbon dioxide, and the arrow up tells me it's given off as a gas. So it's my R group right here. So I'll get this carboxylate anion plus 
water plus CO2 given off as a gas. So I'm going to let you try one. And again, give all the product or products for the following reaction. And don't forget, when you're done, give me a thumbs up. Thank you, Joe. All right, everybody's done. So what do I have here? Oh, carbonyl hydroxyl and carbons. I have a carboxylic acid. Oh, I have sodium bicarbonate, baking powder. And I get a carboxylate anion plus water plus CO2. And what's my R group? Methyl. So I'll get this carboxylate anion plus water plus carbon dioxide given off as a gas. Does anybody see the significance of this reaction or something about this reaction? Everybody give up? Well, what's this molecule right here? Acetic acid. And what's this? Well, you can find it in baking powder. And if I look at the clock, I may go a minute or two over, but it'll be worth it. It's time for a story from Dr. White. When I was about six or seven, my father was already getting me interested in chemistry. I wonder why I became a chemist. I don't know. But anyways, back then, when I was about six or seven, the big thing in the United States was the space race with the Soviet Union, the evil communists. And everything little boys wanted and toys and anything were space and rocket ship related. Now, they had this product that was a cylinder that had a cap that had three fins and inside the cylinder, were these little spheres of the most awful candy you ever tasted. And these things costed, cost one cent. Back then there was still a lot of money, not really. And how awful was that? Well, if you gave it to a kid, and like I did, my friends would, we'd take the pot top off with the candy in there, find a garbage can, dump it out, put the cap back on, now you had a rocket ship to play with. What did my father teach me? Which I taught my other friends. Other friends thought my father was really cool and he was. If you take the cap off this part, invert it, it was about two inches long, not that diameter big of it. It's a little test tube. If you put in some vinegar, and then put in very quickly some baking powder. Slam the cap back on. So you now have this. And you got stuff reacting in there. What's happening? 
you're making carbon dioxide gas. And if you held it by the fin and your timing was good, the cast would gas would cause the cap to pop off and go fly about four or five feet. If you're about six years old, that was the neatest thing. You'd hold it and it would go flying about six feet, five, six feet, and you'd go put some more in there and do it again, which we did. Now, unfortunately at the time, and I haven't seen him in decades because he moved out of the area. Um, back then, my best friend was Dickie Gale. Do you ever know where Dickie Gale is? Have him contact me. But anyways, he and his brother thought this is cool. And they used all his mother's baking powder and didn't tell her. And when she went to cook something, where's my baking powder? Oh, did he catch? It was bad. It was, oh, don't ever use up all your mother's baking powder and not tell her when you're doing that. With that, thank you for letting me go a whole two minutes late. Don't forget Wednesday after class, I'll be doing test number two, just like we did test number one. I'll send out right after we end class on Wednesday an email with the PDF, a password for the PDF file. You'll have until Thursday, 10 a.m. to take test number two and upload your answers as a single PDF file. Don't forget today, I have my office hour from 5 to 6.15. If you need any help, come on by. And with that, gang is on. Goodbye. I stole that from... Beverly Hillbilly's granny. <laughs>